the ones where I'm seeing the most demand right now are marketing. And within that, consumer marketing, HCP marketing are both massive, digital marketing as well. And I think that those areas will continue to grow and continue to have more demand, especially between director, senior director, executive director level in marketing. It's extremely hot right now. If I'm looking at commercial operations, I look at the three pillars being Salesforce effectiveness, commercial analytics, and training. I've seen quite a few companies who are, who are really focusing on those areas. This is Real Pharma, your podcast for real conversations with pharma pathfinders. In every episode, you will hear from an industry insider who has a story to share that goes beyond the headlines. No spin, no sacred cows, no hidden agendas, just stories and the people behind them. Now, here are your hosts, Dr. Nari O oh and Ian Wint. Welcome back to another episode of The Real Pharma Podcast. I am Ian Wendt, joined by the acumenist Dr. Nari O. Oh. In this episode, we'll be diving into the 2024-2025 Commercial Market Update and Salary Guide produced by EPM Scientific, which is a leading life sciences recruiter. For me, this report really sheds light on key trends and salary movements that impact sales, marketing, and operations talent across the entire global life sciences industry. So amidst a backdrop of some economic uncertainties and ever-changing priorities, the life sciences sector does remain resilient, and this is driven by aging populations, groundbreaking scientific advances, and robust investment. Perhaps most importantly, EPM's guide also details how these factors are influencing hiring practices and compensation across the Americas, Europe, and APAC regions. And today, we're thrilled to have Christian Rawlings back to join us once again and discuss these findings. Christian is the Director of Commercial Life Sciences at EPM Scientific in Dallas, Texas, where he expertly navigates the complex landscape of the biopharma job market. With a keen insight into emerging trends and the dynamics of job placement and salary benchmarks, Christian helps connect top talent with leading life science organizations. His expertise certainly makes him a go-to resource for understanding the nuances of getting hired in biopharma, Today, he's here to share his valuable perspectives on what's new and what's next in the world of biopharma careers. Christian, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you with us. Hey, Christian. Welcome back to Real Pharma. It's been a while. It's great to be back. I'm happy to be here. It's been a few months since you were on the show last, and we're happy to report that your episode is also the most downloaded out of all the ones that we have published so far. Congratulations. Thank you. And I think it shows the level of interest that people have, obviously, in the job market and what the trends are and what the opportunities are. So now we're in the second quarter of 2024, and we spoke last at the end of 2023. Can you give us broad strokes, an idea of where we are now? Last time when we spoke, it was a little bit of a mixed picture. Not terrible, but not great. So where are we now? Which direction are we moving into? Yeah. So first of all, thank you for inviting me back. I really enjoyed our conversation last year. I think it's certainly put into perspective a lot of conversations and a lot of different headlines, some of which were true, others of which maybe were a little bit too much doom and gloom. This year, and I can't believe we're almost halfway through it already, has gone by in the blink of an eye, but there's been some clear trends. If we remember back to those first couple of weeks of JP Morgan and the healthcare conference that took place in San Francisco, I was fortunate enough to be there on the ground. And there was a palpable feeling of, let's do some deals. Let's let's make things happen. And let's take a, take a real good look at where there's opportunity in this market. And we saw several acquisitions take place there. There was a really keen focus on finding the right assets to acquire. And those generally were focused on specific therapy areas. So what I've seen over the last five months is Companies are not hiring in oncology, in CAR T therapy, in cell and gene therapy, anywhere near as much as they are hiring in a core area of dermatology, respiratory, cardiovascular diseases, ophthalmology, these areas where there are already assets in the market. We're not trying to be a first in class here, but a new generation of therapies are coming out. And I have seen that a lot of the most intense and aggressive hiring 
especially in the commercial space, has been in areas where there is already an existing blockbuster product from the last couple of years. So I'll give you an example. I'm currently working with a variety of dermatology companies who are launching biologics or monoclonal antibodies into the market either already this year or coming up in early 2025. And from my understanding, they're chasing that to pick some market share. So what I'm seeing with companies is as opposed to saying we want to have a brand new indication, a brand new therapy area, anything like that. It's much more, where is there a really solid market where we can help patients and we're going to compete? And so what that leads to is commercial hiring. The area that I've focused on for the last near decade is moving really, really fast, especially as it pertains to hiring the best people to launch your drug into the US market in the coming years and on a global level. So really, when I think about what's happening There's a small number of therapy areas which are moving extremely fast and looking to hire aggressively. Companies are making moves from an acquisition standpoint to reinforce those specific areas. Nephrology is another one of them. If we take a look at Alpine's acquisition just a couple of weeks ago, it's a real indicator of what's going on in those spaces. But you can't launch a drug unless you have the best people in the world in your company, right? Maybe you can launch it, but you can't launch in a hyper-competitive market. So as far as what I'm seeing right now, if you are great at launching, and it's not just a marketeer or a strategist, it's if you're great at Salesforce effectiveness, if you're great at sales training, if you can upskill or create the operational functions to be able to launch a product, then your your stock is rising as a candidate in the moment. And also, as we'll discuss later, so is your salary. Let me ask you a follow-up question to what you just said. What makes somebody especially skilled at launching? What are the profiles that companies are looking for? Since you said it's not so much about oncology specialty, it's more the mass market, in some cases, indications, and you are entering an established market and maybe you have a drug that's better than the standard of care. So what what makes a candidate especially attractive then? So I'm going to look at this from a, an executive level, really senior director through to senior vice president. There are different skill sets for individuals who are at the manager level or maybe associate director. But if I'm looking for a candidate at the moment, someone who's really going to stand out, they're going to demonstrate examples of defining commercial operation strategy and go-to-market strategy so they can write whether it's on a napkin or on a whiteboard or wherever, they can write out, these are the people that we need to hire to be able to have the best-in-class launch. And that generally comes from previous experience doing it. Add on top of that, your existing therapy area experience. Respiratory is a space that is is booming. Again, Dupix and that kind of COPD asthma space, there's a lot of companies going to market there. So you need to have existing experience of maybe launching something like Zolair to be able to come to market and say, okay, I know what I'm doing. And then you need to have that experience building out the infrastructure. So tangible examples, that's the first thing. You need to be able to provide a a longer term roadmap, not just the the first three months getting in and hiring a few people, but where's this going to be two years from now? And how can you project what is going to be needed inside of the market? Let's think about when iPads were rolled out to sales forces, how much that changed the game with regard to HCP interaction. If somebody was coming in today and saying to me, Well, a year and a half before that was actually enacted, I was the person who put on my hand and said, we need to go through this digitalization process. It doesn't matter if that was five or six years ago. Those are the kind of things which I think really make us candidates stand out because they're showing, especially from commercial operations, what they've actually done to move the needle for the field force and subsequently increase the success of the product. And then the the final thing is the person needs to have, and we're going to come on to this later as a key point that I want to talk about, but the person needs to have executive presence at the highest level. This is something which may sound crazy, but I have seen or heard or been a part of many a process where there's been two candidates neck and neck and the person who's won out has had better executive presence because for these leadership roles, they're not hiring people unless they've actually met them in person. So this is something, again, we should dig into more, but These are some of the really key things, especially around commercial leadership positions that I'm personally looking for when it comes to making a selection to send to clients. So it's really interesting that you say that, Christian, because we have an episode upcoming on exactly that executive communication and executive presence with Dr. Laura Socola. So I'll make a plug for that right here. Amazing. I'll be tuning in for that. Yeah. And one of the things you just mentioned it, and I saw this in the report as well, surprised me a little bit. 
But is this shift in focus maybe away from life-threatening diseases to, I think, what's described as more common health issues? And, you know, you called out a couple, maybe it's respiratory or maybe even derm. And I wonder what's behind that. You hear that maybe there's patent issues and pipeline issues that we're not generating maybe as many new innovative therapies in those areas, maybe other factors at play there. But I wonder if you can identify for us the cause behind that trend, because it was a little bit surprising to me to hear. Honestly, I'm seeing these things coming through and reacting to them in the market, but the causation behind it, I don't have enough of a, an understanding of drug pipelines long term. What I would say is that over the last 10 years, there has been such a heavy focus on oncology with immuno-oncology immunotherapies. And where's the market opportunity if you're bringing a PD-1 inhibitor to the market when you have Opdivo and you have Keytruda? And it's amazing. I mean, we're seeing people going with stage four melanoma and having one course of Keytruda and, and they're in remission and they're living a life. Like that is 10 years ago, that person would have had a very different story. So maybe it's a success of the oncology assets that people aren't trying to go into that space. So they've diversified and they've pushed their clinical research funding into, into other areas. And, and now we're seeing the pull through of that. One area where I would say in oncology, and I know it wasn't necessarily the question, but I just think it, it links in that there is a lot of growth at the moment is radio pharmaceuticals. For anyone with that AAA experience, that's a really, really in-demand skill set. And I'm seeing a lot of smaller companies bringing exciting assets to the market in that. But that's that's the only side of oncology that I'm seeing that's growing at the moment. Um, and it's probably a part of the 16 indications that, that these companies now can boast for their product. One other aspect of that that I end up thinking about, a question, I suppose, is you kind of describe some of the launch experience that makes a candidate valuable or stand out. But do you see that experience very TA or therapeutic area specific? Like you have to have launched oncology drugs to get hired for the next oncology asset that's going to be approved. The same thing for DERM or the same thing for whatever other therapeutic area you might be looking at. Or do you see some folks that are just good marketers, good launch experts, and they can cross TAs? I mean, how, how siloed do you think that is when you're thinking about what your clients are looking for? Yeah, that'll very much go down to what the hiring manager says in the briefing conversation. I recently placed a head of health economics into an organization, and that candidate did not have the relevant therapy area experience. However, they had a really phenomenal background building health economics infrastructure. And there was a list of, if you don't have this specific TA, here are the next three that I'm looking for. And they had two of the other three. So it counts. And so I think that it often comes down to, and this is one of the key things about working through a search consultant, you kind of write your list of specifications out and your recruiter should go out and actively find that for you. So you're, you're picking from the best as opposed to just hoping somebody drops into your inbox. We should really talk about LinkedIn applications and things at some point during this, and I'm sure it's on the list, but that's ultimately what I'm seeing. You don't need to have the therapy area if the hiring manager is open to it, but um, the best bet if you're going to be applying to a role is to try and focus on the therapy area where you are an expert. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Let's actually talk about LinkedIn right now. I'd be delighted to. Because I have a few questions for you. We, we talked about this last time you were on the show as well. It's become much easier to apply for a job. So you see sometimes these huge numbers of applicants for any given job. But the question is, how many of those candidates are really viable? Maybe you can shed some light on that. And then I also have a question for you about ghost postings. Yeah. So first of all, let's talk about ghost posting. At no time should there ever be anybody posting a fake job advert. So can you explain what ghost posting means first for our audience? This is, yeah, sorry. Okay, so it's difficult to explain because a LinkedIn LinkedIn recruiter has a job advert posting function which everybody sees pop up as just a regular job. And within that, if you are a search consultancy or a company and you're looking to just build your network, the single cheapest way to build your network is to just post job adverts through LinkedIn, right? Because they have an incredible reach and LinkedIn's algorithm is set up to get maximum amount of impressions, especially if people are reposting and things like that. As such, if you post a job advert with a sexy title, 
then you can get up to five, 600 applications of varying quality, which we'll come on to in the second part of this, but very, very quickly. And you can quite quickly build up your network of folks who are coming through. However, the reality is that you're not going to get a call from a recruiter about that because they're just trying to get your LinkedIn, right? I haven't seen this in anywhere near the numbers that I'm seeing people talk about, you know, 60% of job adverts are fake and all these kind of things. I, I think that's a massive over exaggeration. But even if it's five or 10%, it massively degrades the legitimacy of the market that as search consultants we're working in. And subsequently, I find it so aggravating because it just kind of exacerbates this this feeling of recruiters being maybe a bit shady. And so that's where my, my grievance comes with it as much as anything else. But fake job adverts are a thing. And there are very simple ways to figure out if a, if a job advert is real. First of all, does it have somebody attached to it that's saying, hey, I'm posting this, right? And reach out to that person and ask for a call with them directly, right? Rather than just posting into an advert. And this maybe leads into the second part as well. Look at the job advert and say, okay, is this actually telling a story or is it just a sexy title with no real common sense discussion in there about actually what the role is going to be? And I think this is also a, a potential trap that job seekers are falling into, which is they just see the title and click. They don't open it up check out maybe what asset is going to be focused on in that if it's mentioned or what therapy area is going to be in there and really look at that advert and say, okay, is this written with high quality or am I just clicking on a sexy title? And if you go into that, even just taking an extra five seconds to read it and be like, well, that's nonsense. I don't want to apply to that because it's probably not going to turn into anything if it's not a well-written advert. You're probably not working with a, a you know good staffing consultancy, et cetera. So I think something that I'm you know, insisting on for, for everyone within EPM Scientific is let's write high quality job posts. Doesn't necessarily need to say the drug name in there or something like that, but it needs to be attractive enough that the people who are doing a high level of research before they're applying to a job are proactively clicking on that and not a competitors. So yeah, that's fake job adverts. When it comes to actual people applying to roles, I would say about 60% of the vacancies that I have worked on this year have been senior and have been highly confidential in so much as there will not be a job advert posted for it because it's a confidential search, right? It's going to be really accessing the network. When I have on those other occasions posted adverts, it's basically been an entire day has been spent politely responding to people who are not relevant for the role and explaining to them why they're not relevant for the role, right? Because you don't just want to ignore somebody. You also don't just want to be blunt. But I've had many a situation where I'm posting for, say, an analytics role, and I need pharmaceutical analytics. You know, I need to have a litany of different pieces which outline the job description. And then you have people from a totally different industry who are maybe extremely junior, way too senior, whatever, reaching out to you directly and saying, I'm right for this role because of X, Y, and Z, when they've clearly not read the job description. So, it's not trying to moan. It's much more, if you're applying to a job that you're not relevant to, nine out of 10 times, no one's going to respond to you. Just in the same way as, well, anything in life, if you're not relevant for it, don't be upset if somebody doesn't get back to you. Do your research and only apply to positions where you feel as though you are, you've read it, you've done some research, and from there, you're able to apply. And it might take five to 10 minutes to do that research, but I assure you, you'll be applying to less roles because they're going to be more relevant. And most important thing, you're going to be getting more responses because you are relevant. And from there, it's this positive feedback loop where you get more interviews, you get more offers, you get to negotiate a higher salary, you're in a better job, right? Rather than just swiping on LinkedIn all day and just hoping that something's going to hit. So yeah, categorically of the 300 advert applicants that I had on my last vacancy, I think I called six of them proactively. I spoke with another five who had reached out to me directly and said, hey, you know, here's my resume. Give me a call. And I was like, oh, this person's great. Like, let's have a conversation. Maybe they're not perfect for this role, but they've been proactive and I really appreciate that. So yeah, ultimately, it's, it's, still, it's still a dangerous place to be pin, pinning your hopes. I would much more focus on networking and people that you know. I think that's great advice. I'm impressed that I think you said that you spent a day thoughtfully responding to most or many of the folks that apply I'm hazarding a guess here that you're maybe the exception because it's not what I hear most people's experiences are when they apply on LinkedIn. But but probably the reason for that is just what they said, right? Either they're hopefully they're they're not in a situation where they're applying without their knowing it to, to some ghost posting, but maybe they are applying for roles that they're just not 
suitable for, and they shouldn't be surprised when they don't get a response, but very thoughtful of you to, to at least help people understand maybe why <laughs> they're not being considered. And that's been my experience. We post on LinkedIn, like a lot of companies do occasionally. And I would say maybe 2% of the 2 to 3% maybe of the respondents even meet the job qualifications. I think there is a lot of folks just hit it. It's so easy to hit that easy apply button. I think it's called easy apply, right? And I think people think it's just shots on goal or the shotgun, you know, kind of approach. It's very little efforts, but it does clog up your inbox with a lot of folks that you're just not ever going to consider. So it takes a lot of time to go through that. So I'm sure that's uh, can be a big part of your day. I can see that. It's a vicious cycle. But equally, when you post roles for either of your organizations, how many recruiters are reaching out to you asking if they can work on that proactively? Any. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, Nari, but yeah, I get a lot of direct messages in LinkedIn from recruiters darn near every day. Yeah. The thing that I'm seeing right now is the length of time is actually taking to fill a position. And we spoke about this at the beginning of the year that vacancy processes had, had dramatically increased because people were being more selective. There was more talent on the market, which was actually slowing things down because people may be getting a bit spoiled for choice. I've seen a continued extension of that process because everything's going back to being on site, right? And this maybe links in a little bit with the executive presence piece, but we're now back in those heady days of 2018, 2019, where we want to bring one person on site and we have to line up five executives simultaneously to be there on the same day and, and all these kind of things. So it's not just the amount of candidates who are applying to roles that's maybe slowing things down. It's also for a lot of companies, they really want to meet people and they're willing to wait to get everybody on site and to, to have these conversations. So yeah, if you're actively applying to positions and listening to this, expect to be going on site again. And I think that's exciting. We're definitely seeing that same dynamic. Yeah. And, and there does seem to be more talent available, which to your point, I think does slow down the process a little bit because there's more to choose from. And, and I guess as a on the hiring side, maybe there's some advantages to that. Is that kind of a buyer's market, I guess, in terms of the hiring companies can be more selective because there is more talent kind of on the sidelines. And, and have we seen any improvements there? Are we likely to see any improvements? Because that might be good news if you're trying to find talent. It's bad news if you're out there trying to find a job, I suppose. Yeah, it depends entirely on the space and your experience. So again, if you're in a specific type of oncology right now, say uh, hematology oncology, and you want to really continue to focus in that space, less less vacancies, more competition, it's going to be tough. However, if you're agnostic to the therapy area and you're, say, very, very good at field analytics, then please call me because I can honestly tell you that we are inundated with positions in that space. So it's very much in individual verticals of demand uh, rather than just the whole market, there's pockets. So again, I'll give you an example. If you are an ophthalmology marketeer, then there's I would say about six companies that I can name off the top of my head who are hiring for exactly that role, especially if you're open to relocation, right? And they will compete to get the best talent. They will compete on price. They'll compete on relocation assistance packages, everything like that. If you're in another space, it's going to be very difficult. One thing where I am seeing a lot of success is having a, a, a network of executive leaders. And if a candidate comes to me and says, you know, I have this very, very specific experience and uh, and that and one company's interested, then you can actually start really mapping out the entire market and say, okay, if one company needs this, if there's so many companies hiring right now, then this is probably a, a market area. So I think that for some people, they are they focus very very much on just their existing therapy area or their existing sub niche where they're really good or their local geography. If you open things up, then there's a wealth of positions out there that you could go for. You just have to be a little bit more creative or a little bit more, do a little bit more research. Can we dive into the different verticals within commercial? Because again, you, you specialize in commercial, but within commercial, we have different verticals as well. So right now, what are the easiest roles to fill and what are the ones where you can find talent as easily? Sure. Well, no one calls me about the easiest roles to fill because they can fill them on their own. So it's, it's going to be a difficult one to say that. <laughs> fair, fair enough. <laughs> the, the ones where I'm seeing the most demand right now are marketing. And within that, consumer marketing, HCP marketing are both massive, digital marketing as well. And I think that those areas will continue to grow 
and continue to have more demand, especially between director, senior director, executive director level in marketing. It's extremely hot right now. If I'm looking at commercial operations, this is where I've seen the bulk of my assignments coming in this year. And so I, I look at the, the kind of the three pillars being Salesforce effectiveness, commercial analytics and training. I've seen quite a few companies who are, who are really focusing on those areas. And so within that, you'd be baffled the amount of incentive compensation vacancies that are going on at the moment. And I think that is, again, companies launching a product, needing to make sure they have the most competitive bonuses for their field team. And from there, they need really great talent, right? So within that kind of sub-niche analytics, and I'm not, I'm not looking at hardcore SQL, SaaS, coding, analytics here. I'm talking more building dashboards, communicating with your sales leadership and being able to be that bridge. So if you have a strong analytics background, but great communication style, then there's a lot of jobs out there. And when we think about competition, that's where you're going to get the highest salaries. That's a really in-demand area. I'm seeing a lot of demand for competitive intelligence. Again, because so many companies are launching drugs in the same space, I'm going to sound like a broken record here. All the areas where you can get a competitive advantage, really, really booming. We're also seeing on the the field side of things, a lot of sales bills going on at the moment. So when these companies are launching, and it's a, I can talk to you a bit about the time that they launch because it's getting closer to Padufa than ever before, really running it, running it right up to the line. But when they do go, the sales builds move really, really fast and they're paying really well right now. What about market access? It seemed for a while that there was a lot of demand for market access roles. Going into this year, if I think I got one thing wrong in my assessment of what we were going to need in 2024, it was market access. I thought that that was going to be the highest and hottest area to hire in for this year. But it's been pretty quiet. It's really been pretty quiet. And I, I don't understand why, because surely market access would link into this competitive therapy areas, get access and make sure that the product is actually viable. But I've just not seen that much demand. And that may be because there was a lot of people who were open on the market last year. And so they've kind of filled those gaps. But I would see more of a spillover, even if that was the case. So let's talk money just briefly. Everybody likes to talk about that. Because there's one dynamic here that I'm still trying to get my head around. Maybe you can help me with. So we've talked a little bit about all this talent, right, that's available. So supply is high. And I think something that goes along with that is something we talked about last time you were on the podcast is title deflation, right? Where you see folks having to take more either lateral moves or at least in terms of title, maybe not scope, but in terms of title, take a step down to be competitive for role. So that kind of makes sense when you have a higher supply of talent. But the thing that that I can't get my head around as much is that pay salaries seem to be holding pretty strong or going up. And you'd think with all this extra talent, you could be more competitive on the hiring side and, and maybe get some bargains to bring in the talent you want because there's so much around. Great talent will always have choices, irrespective of the market. And as such, the spikes that we have seen, maybe they're due to inflation. I think more likely they're due to the fact that for the really, really great people, especially with this title deflation, you're going to have to pay a pretty penny for them. And I've continued to see for the best talent, companies are willing to go at a VP level, are willing to go 10 to 15% above their range at a VP level to secure the best person for the job. And there is generally going to be a couple of people right at the final stage. So it's not that they are without choice, but to make the pick that's going to help you launch this drug, people are willing to put an extra $20,000 down on the table to do it in the short run if it means that they're going to obviously make however many more millions than that in the long run, just candidly. Now, there is continued um, title deflation across the market, right? But I, I have seen it, it lessen somewhat of late, especially if we look at candidates having a quick promotion once they've joined a company. So this is something that I've seen quite a lot with many of the folks who were a VP and then they went to a senior director last year to secure a great role. What we discussed, you know, the stability of a company, the pipeline, the manager you're going to work for, but then really quite rapidly getting a promotion up to an executive director or maybe even back to a VP. So yeah, tight deflation was there, but the smart companies who put the money down on the table ran a great recruitment process in 2023, got a stellar candidate and have worked fast to improve their title as the market has picked up. That was some really, really great business. And for the candidates who secured those, it was extremely smart. It was a risk and, and they're successful. It's going to continue this year. 
but salaries are definitely going up, especially between the senior director and VP level. That's where I'm seeing the greatest delta at the moment. So we can actually talk through a bit more of the the salary table if that's going to be helpful. So when I look at, again, commercial operations has been the prime topic of today. If I map really director through to vice president right now, I'm just going to do them quite quickly. For a director of commercial operations, minimum that I'm seeing is 215 on the base. This is up from 200 just four months ago. And then the max is held pretty stable at 250. However, we have placed several directors in commercial operations at 260 base for companies who are in Boston who are launching hyper-competitive products. That's the director. If we look at senior director, bonuses, long-term incentives, those don't change anywhere near as much. Base salary is, I think, what we're discussing today. If I look at senior director, whereas six months ago, 250 to 280 was really what, what we were going for. For an experienced senior director, maybe someone who's an exec director who's taking a step downwards, you can see 300K for a senior director right now pretty comfortably. And that isn't just in Boston. That's across the US for the best candidates. I've got typically quite financially conservative companies now moving their bands up to more like 295 for a senior director. So again, if you have the right therapy area experience, if you have aced your interviews and you're you know, really well regarded, great references, et cetera, then you can ask for that. You can ask for that higher limit without too much fear of not getting it. Going to a VP, a VP spread is pretty big these days. So what I look at is on the very, very low end is 290 on the base. That's the lowest that I've seen a company offering and it was going to be tough to get that. The midpoint, 330 to 340 is something that I really feel as though is quite attainable for anyone who is a, a very experienced executive director or is already a vice president. And then for if you tick every single box, you have great executive presence, you have great references, et cetera. I've seen companies willing to offer up to about 365 on the base salary. If you're listening to this and you're above this, congrats, you're in the top 1%. But those are going to be the general brackets in commercial operations. When I look at marketing, I think that it's more on that senior director. We're looking at like, I would say 275 to 300. I'm not really seeing anyone lower than that right now when they're making a move. Maybe they're paid less than that right now, but that would generally be what I ask for. And then with marketing directors, it's not quite as high as the commercial operations that I found, uh, sorry, for VPs that I found, but they're normally going somewhere about 310. I don't see anyone being lower than 300, but then it caps out generally about 345 for a vice president of marketing. I can speak extensively about what's going on in the US. Fortunately for our clients, we're very specialized. If you want to know about what's happening in the pharmaceutical market in, in Asia, then there are some really great people who can help and simultaneously would love to show you everything that's going on regionally. I think the, the first thing to take a look at is the perception that if you're in San Francisco or if you're in Boston, you're going to be paid drastically more than anywhere else in the country. It's not really anymore. Best paid senior director that I've placed this year and my best paid vice president that I've placed, the senior director is in Texas and the vice president is in North Carolina. Interesting. And we will share the report that has a lot more detail as well. Another topic I wanted to ask you about is not just the different aspects within commercial, but you have some really interesting detail about geography. First of all, within the US, and then also very nicely globally. So you have sections on the US, Europe, and Asia. Can you speak a little bit more towards first the, the regional differences within the US and then what you see globally? There's a, a real, I would say, pull for companies trying to secure the best talent. That is irrespective of where they are around the country right now. There's continued to be a decrease in the amount of hiring that I've seen just on the West Coast altogether and an increase on the East Coast. But it has been in Carolina, in Pennsylvania, in New Jersey, and in Boston. All right, then let's talk about what's happening regionally in the US because that's your expertise. 100%. So ultimately, geography is becoming less of a factor for where you can get paid the most. And opportunities are coming up in all, all areas of the US right now. When we think about you know, biopharma hubs, both established and emerging. So I think if we continue to look at it, there are less opportunities on the West Coast now than I've, I've seen in recent years. There continues to be a move east. And that has meant that I'm seeing a lot more opportunity in Texas than certainly there was three years ago. 
and really solid biopharmaceutical opportunity in Texas. And I mean, when I look at the biggest success story at the moment is Research Triangle Park. I think that six, seven years ago, everyone was was saying North Carolina will be the one where there's you know a massive amount of growth for for life sciences. I'm finally seeing that happening right now. And the companies that are there are paying competitive salaries. The companies that are there are offering great relocation, extremely hospitable interview processes. Something that I think we should always take a look at is how much people feel as though they're really wanted in that location when they're going through the interview process. It's less about money and much more about respect and that feeling of, you know, okay, was there a car there to pick me up from the airport? You know, did people take the time to take me out for dinner and show me around this place that I'm moving to? Or was it just, a, you know, hey, move here if you want to. We've got 10 other candidates. So North Carolina especially does an amazing job just across the clients that I've seen of doing a great job on that. I think that New Jersey, mid-sized pharmaceuticals, you know, that's still still the highest number of mid-sized pharma companies in that state. And they're generally hiring solid and reliable roles. We are seeing some some continued restructures with the larger companies, like very large companies. But then Boston will, for as long as I can imagine, be the top dog around the US. People still move there because they know that once they've you know, had the sticker shock of what it costs to buy a house and, and those kind of things, that they are ultimately in a position where they will be employed forever. Because if one company has a restructure, then there's another one just around the corner to make it happen. So I'm seeing companies trying to compete on price. But I'm really seeing the biggest, biggest kind of impact is your interview process, how much you care about the person who's coming to relocate to your location or, you know, making them feel that they're part of the business, even through the interview process and having those kind of open conversations. So, yeah, if people can do that, if companies can do that, then I think they're going to secure better talent, irrespective of what they can pay. But salaries have gone up. And yeah, it's, it's a good time to be opening your eyes to new roles right now. I think that is so nice to hear that you are highlighting that companies are making an effort also to make candidates feel good and welcome and excited about joining their company. Sounds like something that everybody should do, but I don't think that's really everybody's experience. When I talk to people, it feels often like they're just a number. And so it, that's very encouraging to hear. I hope that more companies jump on that bandwagon. Yeah, I think there's a great lesson in there for For companies, you know, I think it's easy to just, you have your own as the hiring entity, you have your own priorities and pressures and you're trying to move quickly and see as many candidates as possible. And, and it's easy to forget the human side of what that person needs to know and understand and, and make them feel valued. And I think some companies, uh, it's great to hear that some companies are doing a good job there. I'm sure other companies could do a better job. So a question I have for you, you know, there still seems to be this tension maybe in the market, you called it out earlier, where... Companies are requiring, are expecting people to be on site. And I think there's still this dynamic, though, among individuals, they would love to get a remote role because, you know, some people were able to secure great remote roles over the last few years and certainly that model exists. And then there's this dynamic of, you know, what are the trade offs between moving and, and, gee, maybe I have to take a lower title, as we talked about earlier. How are you counseling the candidates as they move through this process and setting expectations? So, for example, if somebody comes to you and says, look, I don't want to move, I want a remote role. And I don't want to take a title cut. Are they just being completely unrealistic or, or is that a realistic expectation to have in today's market? Or do people need to recalibrate a little bit on what's achievable? If there were still senior executive roles that were on a remote basis, then I would counsel people to prioritize those. The simple thing is that for the best positions available in the US at the moment, especially people who are changing companies, they're all going to be on site. And they're going to be on site three days a week. And I have to have this conversation with people who have 25 years of experience and have clearly demonstrated throughout COVID that they can run an extremely successful business unit that isn't relevant. You have to be inside of this commutable geography to be successful. Now, I can get you a red carpet relocation assistance package and you have till the end of the school year or something like that to make it happen, to make the relocation happen. But it's not possible to get the best roles on a remote basis. And And that isn't just me in commercial, that end of the process. EPM offers services throughout the development cycle. And aside from maybe commercial operations, where I still see a lot of remote hiring, the vast majority of companies who are hiring throughout the development process and cycle want to have people who can be on site. I mentioned this earlier in the conversation, but the time to fill has nearly doubled in comparison to what it was in 2021. 
from a vacancy being released to actually getting filled has doubled. So it's for me, longer lead times and things like that on processes, more candidates saying, what's going on? Why has it been three weeks, you know, et cetera. I wish it was quicker, but yeah, that's ultimately what I'm seeing. Uh, but if you are able to demonstrate that flexibility and are able to relocate, then there's there's a huge amount of opportunity out there, especially for people who have that geographic flexibility. All right, Christian, we've talked a lot about commercial because that's your core area of expertise. However, you also work on the broader commercialization aspect, which includes things like medical affairs, an important part of commercialization in many companies, HUR, and other adjacent areas. Can you tell us a little bit more about trends in those fields as well? Yeah, absolutely. Over the last 10 years, I would say six of them I've spent with either a 50 or 100% focus on the medical affairs space, as well as health economics. So it's, it's an area which certainly with your recent episode, I was tuning in and super excited about. As much as there is a lot of volume of roles in commercial at the moment in these kind of key areas, I've always seen that health economics and medical affairs has a much smaller pool of candidates and a really consistently high level of demand for subject matter experts. So whether if we take uh, medical affairs, for example, working on a vice president of medical, it's not about are you a board certified MD anymore. It's much more talk to me about your relevant therapy area experience, your communication style, your leadership style, and how you can help bring assets to market. And I work with a smaller number of medical affairs executives, but I'm seeing a huge amount of demand in that space right now. So I feel as though companies are seeing the value of of ultimately having a VP or a senior vice president of medical affairs bring in new ideas for their launch programs, especially. And I think that's a super interesting space, maybe one for us to have a, have a deeper conversation about. Health economics is just an engine of hiring. Companies are consistently needing to hire the best in class health economics professionals. And there is much more of a development cycle of talent from your fellowship through to your first role, through to your second role, And people are able to climb the ladder quite quickly by being mobile talent and making moves. I've spoken with a lot of health economics professionals who have 15 years of experience, and maybe they've worked for four or five different companies, whereas with a commercial hire, maybe they've worked for two. And I feel as though that diversity of experience, working with different leaders, working on different ideas, really creates great talent. So if we want to do something that's a bit more focused on health economics and and medical affairs, then I'm certainly very happy to do so. But it's, yeah, both of those spaces right now, I'm seeing a lot of hiring, especially at the senior level. I think Christian just invited himself back onto the podcast. You're welcome anytime. (laughs) Yes. So we'll do a follow-up episode because certainly those are two very interesting areas. I think the role of medical affairs has really shifted over the last five to 10 years, the demands, but also the opportunities and how companies are looking at medical affairs in terms of how they can help with launch, but other areas as well. And of course, we just did an episode with Iris Tam on AGOR, really fascinating area. And fortunately, people have now realized the importance of AGOR across the life cycle of drugs. So that it's really encouraging to see. So I am excited about talking to you about those two areas in the future, Christian. Absolutely. And on that note, we are not going to ask you the same question that we asked you last time, but maybe... If you can reflect back on the last few months since you joined us last on the Real Pharma podcast, and maybe there's something that stood out to you as uh, as something interesting or motivating or encouraging in terms of what you're seeing in your work, if you want to share that with the audience. I personally see this idea on executive presence as one of the most interesting and non-degree-based talents and skills that people can really work on this year. There was a a need during COVID to get really, really good at acing your virtual interview, to get extremely engaged from a social media standpoint. Something that I'm super excited about is the return of networking and networking events. The fact that people are able to go back to conferences, the fact that people are having interviews with CEOs in person and uh, flying in and seeing the site. So it's really a call to folks who are looking for a role or passively open to it, or maybe even aren't passive, but somebody's going to give them a call and it's going to be exciting, is to really make sure that your, your executive presence is on point. And for companies, 
who are hiring to remember what it is to be a great host. And you have competition, especially from companies who have continued to maintain this family feel, this engagement level. And yeah, if, if somebody comes out for an interview where they've been, somebody's had lunch with them, they've been shown around the campus, they've been picked up, they've been dropped off, they've been made to feel comfortable. And somebody who's rocked up in an Uber and no one's spoken to them unless they're in their specific box, which one are you going to work for? So I think it's a great time to be back in the field, to be speaking to people. And for me, I absolutely love that. So my reflection over the course of this year, I've been on more trips to different parts of the country this year than I did the combined two years previously. So yeah, more, more to come, I guess, from the air miles standpoint. I love the enthusiasm and, and some great parting thoughts. It gives us all something to think about. And yeah, I think it's exciting times. It strikes me about how much has changed and how much we have to talk about just over the last three or four months. So in three or four months from now, I'm sure we'll have some new things to talk about, uh, as we already mentioned. But thank you so much for your time. Always a lot of fun. I can't wait to get the feedback on this episode. We will make the report that we mentioned kind of at the top of, of the discussion available for download in the show notes so you can see what we're seeing. A lot of valuable information in there. And, and thank you to Christian and EPM for putting that together. And then you also have the contact information for some of your colleagues from Europe and the Asia region in the report. So I hope that our international audience can reach out to your colleagues if that's of interest. 100%. Thank you very much for having me. It is an absolute pleasure and great to be able to share these ideas with you. So thank you so much. Thanks for coming back, Christian. See you next time. Until next time. Bye. Well, Nari, another fun discussion with our friend Christian Rawlings. It's so interesting to me how this is just like this evergreen topic that every time we think about it or, or engage with somebody on this, we discover, I think, new things that, that are important for us to think about as we manage our careers and understand the landscape of the market. It truly is ever evolving. And I think it is so important to make sure that we're just staying abreast of, of those changes so we can put ourselves in a position to be successful in our careers and, and have a chance to pursue the greatest opportunities that might be available to us. But none of that comes easy. And in my opinion, having somebody like Christian, and Christian does a great job at this, but having somebody like that for the guidance and support is just so essential because it's very hard to navigate on your own. I agree. A few things that I took away from this episode. One, you said this as well. I was amazed that Christian takes the time to get back to candidates that he doesn't think are viable for a position that he's posted. I think really that doesn't happen very often. So totally it shows agree. you when you have a good recruiter, you work on a different level of quality. Then he also mentioned that there are some shifts from last time we spoke with regards to what the market's looking for and what skills you have to bring. He mentioned executive presence a few times. And so those are all skills and, and talents that people can work on throughout their career. I think we all need to work on those continuously. And I think you also have to be ready for opportunities if you're so inclined. Like you said, it doesn't come easily. It's not like somebody's going to call you and offer you the perfect job. Uh, it's something that you have to work on actively. It's part of your, your job in a sense, right? Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, you have to have the discipline to allocate some of your effort, if not every week, but certainly every month. It's a great habit to build to work on your network, to understand the job market, to understand where you know, you're at in your own career. Those successes that we all see that other people might be enjoying, most of those did not come about from luck. Most of them came about from, from really hard work and great networking and having the right support people around you. So it's just a good reminder. And we know all those things. I think the challenge is finding time to actually do it. But I think it's great advice uh, to, to learn that discipline and, and exercise it. So I look forward to having Christian back again in the future. We continue this conversation. Of course, managing our careers will always be important for each of us. I think it's something we can certainly revisit. Sounds good. And we will see Christian again in the future, I'm sure. And let's see what he has in store next time. All right. Thanks, Nari. See you next time. Thanks, Ian. Thank you for listening. Please visit us at realpharma.co for more valuable resources. Real Pharma is brought to you by Black Canyon Ventures. Mm -hmm.